Hello and welcome to the Williamsburg York One American Revolution Roundtable Lecture Series, brought to you by the American Revolution Consortium for Civic Education and in cooperation with the Real American Revolution Television Education Program Series. My name is Jeff Lambert and I'm the president of the Roundtable. And today I'm joined by my colleague Randy Flood, who will introduce you to our friend and speaker. Randy, take it away. Thanks, Jeff. Our guest speaker today is award winning author Arthur S. Lefkowitz, who's also a member of the Board of Governors of the American Revolution Roundtable. Now, Art's numerous books include his latest book, which is becoming a bestseller, Colonel Hamilton and Colonel Burr. Also, he's written The Long Retreat. The American Turtle Submarine, Benedict Arnold's Army, the 1775 American Invasion of Canada, and also another one on Benedict Arnold called Benedict Arnold in the Company of Heroes. And he's also the author of the very, very popular Eyewitness Images of the American Revolution. Today, today Arnold will be talking with us about his best selling book, George Washington's Indispensable Men, Alexander Hamilton, Tench Tillman and the aide the camps who helped win the American independence. And I'll let me hold up a copy of the book. This is my copy of the book. It's a tremendous read. Uh, we strongly encourage it. And Art will be talking about it today. So Art, it's a pleasure to welcome you. And we look forward to your presentation. So ladies and gentlemen, Art Lefkowitz. Thank you very much, uh, Randy. It's a uh... It's an honor to have this opportunity to talk to your group. Uh, we'll be talking about the George, my book, George Washington's Indispensable Men. Here's the first edition published in 2003. And uh, let's talk a little about the contents of the book. Um, here's a, a letter, a wartime letter uh, in the handwriting of George Washington and signed by George Washington. Uh, letters like this are very rare. Uh, what's much more common are letters written in the handwriting of Washington's aides de camp. And before we go any further, an aide de camp is the military equivalent of a personal secretary. Uh, aides de camp uh, uh, remain uh, 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 a perk to uh, generals, uh, uh, certainly in uh, Western armies. And uh, Washington, at the beginning of the revolution, was authorized to have two aides de camp and one military secretary. Uh, brigadier generals and major generals in the Revolutionary War Army and the American Army were each authorized to have two aides de camp. So what you're looking at is much more common. Uh, Washington, by the way, uh, wrote uh, 12,000 letters and orders during the course of the American Revolution. It was an enormous uh, undertaking. So what you're looking at here is a letter in the handwriting of Tench Tillman, one of George Washington's 32 aides de camp, but signed by George Washington. Here is another example. This is in the... Um, handwriting of uh, Alexander Hamilton and signed by George Washington. Here's another example. This is in the handwriting of Robert Hanson Harrison, another of Washington's 32 aides and signed by George Washington. So historians looking at these wartime letters and also understanding Washington's level of formal education he was the least educated, formally educated of any American president. He had less formal education than Abraham Lincoln. And so historians in looking at these letters and what you're looking at was the dispatched letter, the actual letter that was sent from headquarters to, to the recipient, looking at the letters and seeing that they're in the handwriting of someone other than Washington, looking at his level of education and also looking at the level of education of the aides de camp who uh, he uh, uh, surrounded himself with during the course of the revolution, 
they were educated men. Uh, uh, on the eve of the American Revolution, there were 800, it's believed that there were 830 college graduates in America. Every one of Washington's aides de camp was either a college graduate or had some level of college education. One of his aides, John Lorenz, was probably the best educated young American at the time of the revolution. We'll talk a little bit more about John Lorenz later. But getting back to the, to the idea that Washington did not write these letters. Well, this is erroneous. Um, a careful study of his letters reveals that they all read exactly the same. They're very diplomatic, they're respectful. He tended to present the gloomiest appraisal of a situation. He tended to make emotional appeals, such as the suffering of the army and the distress of the men. Uh, uh, and so all the letters read the same, no matter who wrote them. Clearly, Washington was had uh, it command and he was dictating the contents of these letters. After a while, the aides learned the style of writing that he demanded, and they could give him drafts of letters that, uh, uh, that he would approve. He approved all the correspondence. And um, so here again, you have Washington's level of education. I wanted to quote to you talking about the idea that he presented the gloomiest appraisal possible. This is how he communicated. Uh, as a young officer in the French and Indian War, a young Virginia officer, Washington uh, was uh, very confrontational with uh, the civilians who were uh, financing his, uh, his uh, Virginia regiment. And uh, he was arguing with them constantly. And he realized as he matured that he accomplished nothing. All he did was antagonize these people. And so he developed a writing style, which was uh, very diplomatic, very, very carefully worded. But he also used the technique of frightening these people, encourage them to act and so when he arrived at Valley Forge on December 23rd, 1777, um, he wrote John Hancock, and this is the greatest one-liner, in my opinion, that, that Washington ever wrote. Writing from uh, Valley Forge, Washington said, this army must inevitably be reduced to one or other of these three things, starve, dissolve or disperse. So this was his writing style. Now, let's look at some of the men who were, who served as his aides de camp. Here's um, uh, Thomas Mifflin, uh, one of Washington's first aides. He was one of Washington's first aides de camp. He met Mifflin during uh, the Continental Congress. He was uh, a Philadelphia merchant. He was a, a college graduate of what today would be the University of Pennsylvania. This is his portrait with his wife by the American artist John Singleton Copley. Mifflin went on to become uh, one of the governors of Pennsylvania, a very educated man, uh, a merchant. Uh, Washington led him socially. He liked him and invited him to be one of his aides de camp. It's important to look, when you look at these men, to realize that traditionally generals would pick aides de camp who were young dashing officers, uh, perhaps uh, from uh, important influential families, uh, members of the nobility, men who made a very uh, uh, dashing, handsome appearance. Uh, the, the generals uh, might use their aides to sit around and talk with them, you know, and uh, to share uh, dinner with him and jokes with him. Washington had a very different idea. This is one of the uniquenesses of George Washington. Uh, you could criticize his generalship, generalship during the American Revolution. How many battles did he win? How many battles did he lose? But he was so unique and so interesting in many other facets. 
one of which was his selection of the men who he wanted to serve as his aides de camp. He picked men who were educated, who could help him uh, administer the Continental Army. Now, he did not uh, re he did not re rely or consult with these men in terms of strategy. His senior um, line officers, Nathaniel Green, Henry Knox, these were the men that he turned to for advice on strategy and tactics. But in the day-to-day -day administration of the Continental Army, which was critical to the success of the war, he relied on the opinions uh, and the advice of his uh, aides de camp. And so he didn't pick men who necessarily had any military experience. Uh, early in the war, none of them had any military experience. Uh, he picked on men who he thought were intelligent, educated people. And that's fascinating as, as a man who had very little formal education, who had only traveled outside uh, the 13 colonies uh, once uh, in, his, in his lifetime. Uh, he went to the island of Barbados with his, uh, uh, with his uh, half brother, Lawrence. Uh, Washington was not traveled. He spoke no foreign languages. He was very poorly formally educated, and yet he was very comfortable in the selection and surrounding himself with very intelligent people on his, on his so-called headquarters staff. Now, here's another good example. Here's Joseph Reed, another early uh, governor of Pennsylvania. Um, Joseph Reed had two degrees from what is today Princeton University. He was a, a pre-war lawyer, no military experience. Washington asked Reed to join his staff as one of his first aides de camp at, at the opening of the revolution. Um, uh, I'm sorry, we don't have a pointer here, but here's the uh, famous uh, John Trumbull portrait of uh, uh, the Battle of uh, Trenton, uh, there's the uh, wounded uh, Colonel Johann Roll being held up by a man who would later become one of Washington's aides, uh, William Stephen Smith. But behind Washington are the only known life portraits of Tench Tillman and Robert Hanson Harrison. Tench Tillman was uh, a graduate of what today would be the University of Pennsylvania. He was a Philadelphia businessman at the start of the war. Uh, he was a militia officer. Washington met him early in the war and invited him to join his staff. But Tillman uh, served the longest of any of Washington's aides over six years. The man on horseback next to him is Robert Hanson Harrison. Robert Hanson Harrison was a Maryland lawyer, no military experience. Washington knew Harrison because Washington had a whole battery of lawyers prior to the American Revolution. He was very litigious, if I'm pronouncing that word correctly. Robert Hanson Harrison was his lawyer who specialized in bankruptcy. If you owed money to Washington and you went bankrupt, he would send Harrison after your estate to see what he could uh, get out of it. And so here you have examples of two more of Washington's aides, educated men, no military experience. Alexander Hamilton. Now, this is an interesting portrait. This was done by uh, the same artist who did the cover. I guess this is a good segue to show you again the original uh, uh, edition of the book, George Washington's Indispensable Men. In the second edition, the cover art was done by uh, an, a military artist uh, named George Woodbridge. Sadly, uh, George died about, uh, this book was published in 2003, and I imagine George uh, Woodbridge died in about two, 2010. Um, the reprint of the book, the one that's available now, is missing all these beautiful portraits and illustrations. I had George Woodbridge, I commissioned this portrait of Alexander Hamilton as we believed he looked at the time of the revolution. There's only one wartime portrait of Hamilton that I'll show you in just a minute. But the point is, I just checked on Abe Books, the used book site, and there are copies of the first edition for sale. They're used copies. 
for uh, the the lowest price I found this afternoon was uh, twenty two dollars. If you want, it's interesting. There's one new copy of the book for sale. It's two hundred and sixteen dollars. So uh, okay, you know, but I would encourage you if you like the book to buy a used copy of the of the first edition because it has all the George Woodbridge illustrations. Uh, the cover art, the Stackpole, who published both the first and second edition of the books, the, they didn't like this um, uh, this illustration. Uh, they wanted something more with action in it. So I gave them um, um, the port, the painting of uh, of the the capture of Major Roll, the Battle of Trenton is on is on the cover. But uh, the original illustration is here. The maps are also missing from the second edition and only available on the first edition. So back to the story. So here's what Alexander Hamilton. Now, Hamilton was an interesting guy. He served as an aide de camp for four years. Um, it's interesting that, that there's this idea today in these uh, uh, Broadway plays and, and other biographies of Hamilton that Hamilton was uh, George Washington's right-hand man, his, uh, his, his advisor. Uh, there's all kinds of terms used, uh, uh, his uh, senior advisor. Uh, this, is, this is all crazy when you study the, the role that Washington's aides played. Hamilton joined Washington's staff in 1777. He served for four years. He was brilliant. There's no question about it. And Washington kept him on as an aide longer than he should have been. What it, This was extremely hard work. Washington was a workaholic, and he expected the men who served on his staff, his, they, he called them his military family, his headquarters staff. There was no modern headquarters staff. He didn't have uh, people involved with intelligence and logistics. The only people he had were his aides, and he was using them uh, creatively, unlike any other, uh, certainly uh, general in the period of the Revolutionary War, was using his personal staff. Uh, Hamilton and all the others, he called them penmen. Uh, he expected them to be able to draft his letters and then create beautiful uh, dec uh, docketed copies, uh, dispatch copies is the correct term, that would be sent to the recipient. And he was particularly fussy about the appearance of the letters that he sent uh, to uh, the British officers. He was corresponding uh, certainly with General uh, Sir William Howe regularly, mostly about prisoner exchanges uh, during the war. Uh, Hamilton served for four years. Um, so, you know, if he was so brilliant and indispensable, well, if you study Washington's administration during the revolution, uh, things ran very smoothly before Hamilton arrived, and they continued to run very well after Hamilton arrived. If you had to say who was Washington's most important wartime aides de camp, it, it would be one of four men, uh, Hamilton, uh, Robert Hanson Harrison, uh, Tench Tillman, and a very interesting uh, aide who served Washington late in the war, David Humphreys. And uh, but let's go on. Whoop, we went too fast here. Wow. I got to go back here. Okay. So as promised, here's here's a little miniature of John Lorenz. Uh, sadly, he was killed in a minor skirmish with the British late in the Revolution. John Lorenz was the, the son of Henley Lorenz, a very wealthy South Carolina plantation owner, uh, an importer and seller of slaves. He was the president of the Continental Congress uh, after John Hancock um, resigned. Uh, John Lorenz was tutored first at home as a young man, which was common among the wealthy. And then he was educated in Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, he spoke several foreign languages. He next studied law in London. And when the revolution began, he wanted to come back to America. He wanted to fight in the revolution. His father was uh, very reluctant to, to let him get involved uh, in combat. And so he arranged for him with Washington's consent 
to join Washington's uh, staff as an aide de camp. Although once he became an aide, he right away he got into he was involved in in considerable fighting, particularly at the Battle uh, of a German Town. So here you have a, a, a very brilliant, young, educated person save, serving on Washington's staff. And um, John Lorenz admired Washington. He was one of uh, Washington's greatest uh, admirers. So here's another of the aides de camp. Uh, this is Jonathan Trumbull, one of uh, uh, the governor of Connecticut's four sons, a Yale graduate, a school teacher. Uh, joined Washington's staff uh, because he was an excellent writer, an intelligent person. Washington met him, he liked him and invited him to join his staff. What I'm showing you here, with the exception, I should have mentioned that Hamilton had combat experience. Um, he was an artillery officer, a New York artillery officer at the start of the war. Um, Washington met him admired him and asked him to join. Many of these other men had no military experience and there's a major point to be made. Here, speaking of someone with no military experience, here's another one of uh, Washington's important aides de camp. This is uh, uh, James uh, McHenry, Fort McHenry in Baltimore is named after him. This is his portrait by a British artist named uh, James Sharples. Um, McHenry was a doctor. His family were merchants uh, trading uh, all over Europe. And uh, McHenry uh, worked for his family prior to the war in Spain. He, it was Washington, one of the reasons Washington wanted McHenry on his staff is that McHenry was fluent in Spanish. And if you remember, the Spanish came into the war late in the war, and McHenry was the man who was corresponding with the Spanish. Uh, there were at least uh, two men on Washington's staff who were fluent in French. One was certainly Alexander Hamilton, and the other one was uh, Tench Tillman. Late in the war, uh, another aide, Benjamin Walker, who was fluent in French, joined Washington's staff. The alliance with France, Washington wanted people on his headquarters staff who can converse and correspond with the French and eventually with the Spanish. But the point is, McHenry was a doctor. No military experience whatsoever. I doubt if this guy knew which end of the gun the bullet came out of. Okay, so let's go on. Hopefully, hopefully we're going on. Okay, so here at the Potts House, Washington's uh, headquarters during the Valley Forge encampment, you could see they're trying to show you how the aides work. They sat at these desks all day long writing, drafting correspondence for Washington, showing him their drafts, he would review them. We have copies of the drafts in the Library of Congress today. And you can see where Washington noted where he wanted changes made, a word change, a sentence change, uh, some comment in the letters. These guys were sitting at these desks and writing letters all day long. Uh, that accounts for 12,000 uh, letters that Washington wrote during the course of the revolution. So uh, while we're talking about aides de camp, here's Aaron Burr, an early portrait of Burr. It's interesting that Washington invited Aaron Burr uh, to headquarters. Uh, Burr lasted as an aide for about 10 days until uh, Washington traded him uh, for an aide that he admired, who was an aide uh, to General Israel Putnam, whose name was uh, Samuel Blanchley Webb. And Washington traded Webb for Burr. Uh, Burr should have been one of Washington's best and most important wartime aides, but there was a problem. By the way, Burr was fluent in French, which was very attractive to Washington at the time. He was educated. He had a degree from what is today Princeton University. He had combat experience. He was a, a dapper, well-dressed young man, very intelligent guy. The problem was he wasn't respectful enough to Washington. And while Washington was never was not a vindictive person, he demanded respect. And Burr just was 
you know, Burr, John Adams said Aaron Burr was the closest there was to an American aristocrat. Burr was too aloof for Washington's taste and character. And it shows you that there was a training period uh, that he would invite someone that he was interested in to come to work for him at headquarters. And if for any reason he didn't like them or like their work, he would uh, he would make them leave. So here Aaron Burr uh, lost one of the greatest opportunities of his life by, uh, by Washington rejecting him as an aide. Let me see if we can get to the next picture here. Oh, okay. So here is a, a, a portrait of Washington uh, painted late in the war uh, by a, a British artist named Robert Edge Pine. And nobody liked this portrait. Washington, uh, Pine tried to show Washington as he looked uh, uh, towards the end of the war. The guy was exhausted. Uh, he had been working for eight years. It, an interesting point about Washington is he stayed with the army throughout the war. He never left the army except when he had to go to Philadelphia to meet with Congress or for a couple of days on his way to Yorktown, he stopped at Mount Vernon. He remained with the army the entire time and he was respected for that. So here you have Robert H. Pine painting this very realistic portrait of Washington, which brings to mind Washington in his, one of his personal letters said, could I have foreseen what I have and am like to experience no consideration upon earth could have induced me to accept this command. So here you have what, what Pine had to do was to repaint it. He couldn't sell the portrait. And so here's the revised portrait. He was able to sell this one. Portraits of Washington were instant sellers. And what every artist of the period wanted to do was paint Washington. If they can just get his head, they could paint the body. They needed the head. And so Robert H. Pine uh, had to revise his portrait of Washington. And um, now here, as promised, here's the only wartime portrait of Alexander Hamilton. It's a miniature. It was painted by the American artist Charles Wilson Peale. Uh, at the Valley Forge encampment, Peale was going through the camp and painting these miniatures of anyone who had the money to pay him. It was a moneymaker for Peel. And what's so interesting, first we know that this is Hamilton. Um, interesting, uh, it was very macho at the time for these young officers uh, to cut their hair very short. It was also considered to be healthier for them to keep their hair short. So here Hamilton has a very short haircut. But the giveaway is this little green device across his chest. That is called a ribband of office. It is not a sash and it's not a ribbon. It's recalled a ribband of office. Early in the war, the American army adopted a system of identifying rank and function in the American army. Uh, aides de camp were identified by a green ribbon. And so here, Hamilton in this miniature is wearing the green ribbon. We'll look at some other examples of this device. Okay, so here's the first wartime portrait of Washington, painted in 1776 by Charles Wilson Peel. And uh, this is the, uh, um, there's two versions of this. One is in the Brooklyn Museum of Art and the other is in the collection of the White House. And it's interesting that uh, Ronald Reagan, as president of the United States, uh, had uh, this portrait hung uh, right across from his desk. You see portraits of, uh, uh, or you see pictures of Reagan in the White House uh, in the Oval Office, and you see this portrait of Washington. Here you very clearly can see the light blue ribbon. It was a silk ribbon of office. This identified the wearer as the commander in chief of the Continental Army. He's wearing two epaulets. There are no stars on the epaulets at this point of the war. So any senior American officer from the rank of Lieutenant Colonel and above would wear two epaulets. There was no 
authorized color of uniforms, Washington adopted personally the blue and buff color scheme, which was uh, copied by many of his officers in admiration and respect for Washington. So here you have a senior American officer, but he's identified as the commander in chief of the Continental Army by the blue rib end of office that he's wearing across his chest. By the way, Peel could not paint hands. And so he did everything possible to hide hands, which accounts for the awkward position of uh, Washington's hands. Let's see, okay. So here's the second uh, and most famous uh, Washington portrait painted the, during the war, also by the American artist, Charles Wilson Peel. Here you, this is uh, in the collection of the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts. There are some other details of the uniform here, which are interesting, but I just want to focus on the ribband of office. And in the side, you see the flags. Uh, these were Hessian flags captured at Trenton. And in the background, you see Nassau Hall. This is commemorating Washington's great victory at the Battle of Princeton. And Nassau Hall, the, uh, the building of uh, the, what is today Princeton University and, and um, uh, captured British soldiers being marched off. But look at the position, the pose of Washington. His legs are crossed. He has one hand on a cannon. The other arm is in, the, is in a, a cocked position. And look at this. Peel studied art in London for a couple of years. Now, this is a, a portrait of a British nobleman whose name is Augustus Hervey. This was painted by the uh, brilliant British artist uh, Thomas Gainsborough in 1768. It was publicly exhibited. Uh, there were no art shows in America, but there were art shows in, in England at the time. And when he was studying art in London, Charles Wilson Peale saw this portrait at an exhibition. And look at the pose, the crossed legs, one arm, uh, uh, holding the, uh, the cane, the other arm like this. Now look at the Washington portrait. He came back to America and copied the pose because it, it was uh, a very uh, noble pose. And so Peel copied the pose from the Gainsborough uh, portrait. Now, what I'm showing you now is, uh, is that the, this Washington at Princeton portrait is painted numerous times. I recall, I believe, it was painted. Now, these are not copies. Each one is an original. It was painted uh, at least 12 different times. Uh, the versions of this portrait are at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Cleveland Museum of Art, Colonial Williamsburg, uh, the U.S. Senate Building, the White House Art Collection. And um, uh, these, you're looking at different versions of the exact same portrait. Now, this one I know is the one in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, because if you look at the background, it's the uh, Delaware River and uh, the College of Princeton University is missing from the portrait. You're looking at different versions of the same Washington uh, Princeton portrait. And uh, here's another one. You see now, now it's changed. There's a uh, Nassau Hall in the background. And I'm not sure whether you see those two men on horseback and some of the other in the background and some of the other Washington and Princeton portraits. You're looking at another version. You see it's changed. And I'm showing you these because there's something interesting starts going on. The portrait was so popular that, that as fast as Peel could paint them, he was selling them. But as the war progressed, Peel had to update the backgrounds uh, uh, by, by 1781, 1782, people buying these portraits, they didn't want to see Princeton in the background. Here in the background, if you look, and I'll show it to you, um, this is uh, Yorktown in the background. But look at the pose. You see now he's holding some kind of riding crop. Uh, clearly, the Hessian flags are very visible. And here's a very late portrait. Interestingly, the person in the background is Charles Wilson Peel, the artist. He admired Washington so much 
that he wanted uh, to be painted next to him in the portrait. And here also you see the lapel is open. It's called a lappet. You see, instead of the lapel, let's take a look. If we look here. Here, you see the lapel is closed at the top by buttons. And here, well, here you can see it very clearly. Uh, the lappet would be under that top button. Here in this portrait, the lappet is showing. And this is a very late version of the Washington at Princeton portrait. Uh, the, the figure on the, on the bottom, that's General Hugh Mercer, who, of course, was mortally wounded at the Battle of Princeton. Now, here's a very late Washington portrait. And here you see something very interesting is going on. First, in the background, that's Charles Wilson Peel and his brother, James Peel, another artist of the Revolutionary War period. James Peel is the father of America and still life. And of course, the, the Peel brothers, they admired Washington so much that they wanted to be included in his portrait. But if you look at the epaulet, you see the three stars. The rib end of office is gone. This is a late Revolutionary War portrait. About 1778, the Americans abandoned the wearing of these ribbands of office in favor of, of line officers uh, wearing stars on their epaulets. Also, the epaulet is very elaborate. As the war goes on, France enters the war, the Americans are able to import not only uh, very fancy epaulets, uh, but also the material to make the epaulets, the gold braid. Here, Washington is wearing, uh, has three stars on his epaulet. This identified him as the commander in chief of the American army. Uh, the American army had two general ranks, brigadier general, which who wore one star, major general who wore two. The British army had the rank of lieutenant general. Now, this is a very fine point of history because technically, Washington is wearing three stars on his epaulet during the revolution to identify him as commander in chief of the army. In 1798, Washington came back into military service at the request of President John Adams for fear that there was gonna be a war with France. And Washington again wore three stars on his epaulet, but he was commissioned by John Adams as a lieutenant general, the first lieutenant general of the American army. So you might read that Ulysses S. Grant was the first lieutenant general in the American army, the first uh, uh, American officer to wear three stars as lieutenant general, but actually technically Washington was first. Okay, let's go on here. Okay, here. There were about 100,000 men who served in the Continental Army throughout the revolution. Uh, they were drifting in and out of service. Uh, some would serve one year, some would, uh, as the war went on, they would agree to serve for three years of the duration of the war. Uh, but uh, uh, so you, here you have 100,000 men, uh, theoretically in uniform, there is only one complete American uniform from the American Revolution. There are a few random pieces, this is the only complete uniform. And even this uniform is not complete. The waistcoat is a reproduction. The rest is original. This happens to be the uniform of Tench Tillman, one of Washington's aides de camp. Again, the colors are blue and buff in, in emulation and respect the admiration of Washington. The American uniforms as shown by this example were very simple. There's no gold lace. There's nothing very elaborate. You can see this uniform. It's in the Maryland Historical Society in Baltimore. It's on display there. And if you look at the uniform, the buttons are very plain. Uh, the cut of the uniform is very plain. But what's interesting is it was very high quality, very expensive fabric, and the uniform was very tailored. Uh, the uniform of the American Revolution, you look at the sleeves, it was all very tight fitting, beautifully fitted to the wearer. You see, especially sometimes in these movie depictions of the revolution, you see men wearing these very floppy, loose fitting uniforms, particularly the officers, that is not correct. Look at the uniform, look at the sleeves, how tight fitting they are. So we only have of 100,000 men, 
who served uh, in the Continental Army. We've got one uniform left. And uh, whoops, let's go. Okay, now here, this is really interesting because Charles Wilson Peel, I showed you the Washington portrait where in the background, Washington uh, and uh, Peel wanted to show Yorktown in the background because he had to keep upgrading, updating the backgrounds as the war was going on. So he sent his brother, James Peel, down to Yorktown right after the, the successful siege, and he painted and he wanted James Peel to paint that background, to paint this scene, which he put into his Washington portraits. So the existence of the figures on the, on the left is, is incidental to the purpose of this painting. This painting was, was done to give his brother, Charles Wilson Peel, the background that he wanted. But the figures are really interesting because late in the war, uh, you can see Washington the third from the left. Next to him are two of his aides the camp, and it's difficult to see the exact color scheme, but the Americans uh, uh, abandoned the riband of office and adapted the French army system. They liked the French army system of identification, and they uh, uh, aides the camp were identified by a green and white plume in their hat, which these two aides are wearing. So look at the background and then hopefully we'll go on there. You see, here's a late Washington at Princeton portrait. There's Yorktown in the background. Fascinating that Charles Wilson Peel needed that background, that it had to be accurate. Now, here's a modern uh, version of uh, uh, painting of, uh, of Washington and uh, correctly showing how he would have moved on a battlefield. Uh, here you see him with the, uh, he's wearing the light blue ribbon of office and behind him is one of his aides the camp. You can see the green ribbon, okay? And the aide was ranked as Lieutenant Colonel. Aides to Washington were ranked as Lieutenant Colonel, Colonels. Aides to all other American generals were ranked as major. So when you go back to the story of uh, Aaron Burr, uh, that Aaron Burr didn't want to uh, stay on Washington's staff is one of the stories. He wanted more action. Aaron Burr uh, was very interested in, in trying to achieve the highest rank possible during the war. He would not have voluntarily given up the opportunity to be uh, a lieutenant colonel as Washington's aide and accept the position as, uh, as an aide to Israel Putnam with the rank of major. So again, Washington's aides were ranked as lieutenant colonels during the war. And here you can see in a, in a battle combat situation of how Washington was using his aides. The aides were his personal representatives. Uh, let's say the Battle of Monmouth, if Washington wanted a, a, a brigade or a regiment to move somewhere, he didn't have time to write out an order. He would give a verbal instruction to one of his aides, and they had to stay with him two or three and all the time. And he would tell them what he wanted done, and then they would ride off. So if this officer rode off, rode to some regimental or brigade commander and said, you know, move to the left, uh, one mile to the left. Well, who was this guy? I mean, you could see he was a, a, a lieutenant colonel or maybe above, but the green ribbon immediately identified him as a personal representative of the commander in chief, and you had to obey what he told you to do. That's one of the reasons Washington was so fussy about the men who he wanted as aides of the camp. It doesn't mean that these men went into battle. It was just the opposite. They were couriers. They were Washington's personal representatives on the battlefield. Okay, so we got to change the subject here to one of my favorite topics, which is the so-called, and this is really explained in great, everything I'm talking about is explained in great detail in my book, but this is the so-called Washington's headquarters flag. This is exhibited in front of the Potts House, which was Washington's headquarters during the Valley Forge encampment. The so-called Washington's headquarters flag is, uh, is uh, 
It was originally owned by the Valley Forge Historical Society. Uh, their collection uh, became part of the new Museum of the American Revolution in Philadelphia. And the Museum of the Revolution adopted this flag as their symbol. Um, I noticed when the museum first opened, the flag was on display, uh, on permanent display. I'm not sure if it's there anymore because there's a whole furor and controversy over the accuracy of this flag, whether this is actually George Washington's headquarters flag. Now, one of the major pieces of evidence that's pointed to that this is Washington's headquarters flag is this painting by uh, James Peel, and there's another version by uh, General Hugh Mercer's son. I think his name was William Mercer. Uh, I believe this looks like the Mercer version of the painting and not the Peel version, but they're both exactly the same. So there you see George Washington on horseback, and behind him, boy, look at that. There's Washington's headquarters flag. Well, is it Washington's headquarters flag? First, Okay, it appears to be a section of a flag, like the canton, just one part of the flag. The flag is, is in such, painted in such a position that it looks like it's just a piece of the flag. There is no evidence. Washington kept copious records of every dime that he spent, and his expense money was repaid to him or uh, uh, during the course of the war. There is no account in his expenses for a headquarters flag, material to make a headquarters flag, or a seamstress, somebody to sew a headquarters flag. There is, the Americans tended to follow the British army in terms of uh, their organization. There was no British officer, no British general in the American Revolution who had a personal or headquarters flag, okay? The, the existence or the story of the flag is based on a family legend. A, a, a close study of the flag, an examination of the flag, reveals that it's made out of inexpensive fabric. Washington would have never to had tolerated anything that was cheap looking as part of his headquarters. And Perhaps most important, it's a ridiculous idea to believe that George Washington would have gone on to a battlefield like here at the Battle of Princeton with a flag to identify his position. Washington was a product of the frontier. He was an Indian fighter. He understood the mentality of Indian tactics basic to the Indian tactic was to identify and kill the leaders or the officers. It's, it, is, it is just inconceivable that someone of Washington's experience would have gone onto a battlefield with a flag flying next to him, identifying his position. What this seems to be is some kind of regimental flag or the artillery in front of him was uh, Muller's uh, I have his name here. Let me get his name right. This is very important. We'll have to work with Muller for the moment. Uh, this could have been the flag from uh, uh, Muller's uh, uh, artillery battery. Also, what is very interesting is there are a couple of uh, horsemen surrounding Washington. Uh, from the uniforms, these appear to be members of the, uh, uh, the Philadelphia uh, uh, militia light, in, light dr dragoon company who were known to have been with Washington at the Battle of uh, Battle of uh, Princeton. There's no doubt that this is Washington, but to assume, uh, and that's the major evidence to support the fact that the flag, uh, currently owned by the Museum of the American Revolution, was Washington's headquarters flag. Okay, let's see what the next thing is here. Okay. Now, this is in the, the book, the first edition. This was a fantastic illustration that I had George Woodbridge uh, uh, done, uh, commissioned for the, for the book. Originally, it was supposed to be on the cover, but the, the picture was so complicated that it didn't work as a cover uh, illustration. We had to pick something else. Now, we know from the court martial of General Charles Lee, we know where everybody was during the Battle of of Monmouth, which of 
June 28, 1778. So here you have at about 1230 in the afternoon, one of Washington's aides, Alexander Hamilton, riding up. Uh, the main American army is coming up in support of uh, Charles Lee's initial attack. Okay, now we know exactly who was with Washington at the time and going from left to right, the first figure uh, depicted is Tench Tillman. And then the guy wiping his head is James McHenry. The next one is John Fitzgerald, who I haven't mentioned. John Fitzgerald was a, um, a Virginia businessman. Uh, Washington knew him before the war. They did business together. And uh, Washington invited Fitzgerald to become one of his aides de camp. And the last guy is William Hanson Harrison. Not one of these men had any military experience. Here you are, Washington is on a battlefield. Who's protecting Washington? Well, he did have something called the commander in chief's guard, also called the lifeguard. But we know at the Battle of Monmouth, he had them out on the battlefield. Uh, they, they varied in number from 40 men to up to 120 men during the course of the war. Washington wanted that when he was in some stationary uh, situation, like at the Potts House at Valley Forge, he needed these men to guard him to keep him from being kidnapped uh, by the British. OK, but in a battle situation, we know at the Battle of Monmouth that the commander in chief's guard were off fighting. They were also guarding his headquarters, so-called headquarters baggage behind the lines. These men had uh, uh, tents, they had their own food, they had uh, bedding and furniture, and even more significant were all of Washington's headquarters papers. He had copies of everything and he was fanatical about protecting and securing all those papers. That's the stuff that we have in the Library of Congress today. He kept that very carefully uh, during the course of the war and had it very heavily guarded by the commander in chief's guard. So here you have Washington on a battlefield, okay? He has no protection. First, he's carrying two ceremonial pistols and a sword. Uh, his aides de camp uh, might be armed with pistols and perhaps a sword, but they weren't soldiers. They had no military experience, okay? I believe that this young, there's another figure here, this uh, young uh, black man, his name was William or Billy Lee, that Billy Lee, was Washington's personal bodyguard during the course of the American Revolution. First, Washington wanted to display courage to his men on, in battle. And so if he went onto a battlefield, he didn't want to be surrounded by 40 men on horseback protecting him. This is so-called the uh, lifeguard or commander in chief's guard. He wanted to be conspicuous. He wanted to be seen as a, as a person of courage and to encourage his men to emulate uh, his ideas of personal courage. And, but he wasn't also, um, uh, he was also a practical man. He realized that they needed someone to protect him. Now, these guys, they couldn't protect him. Uh, they weren't heavily armed. They didn't have any military experience. And so you, you study the revolution and you say, well, who was protecting him? I believe that throughout the war, this young black slave who was an excellent rider, we know that he carried a, a spyglass, which is shown in the figure, that he was providing personal security to Washington throughout the war. And when Washington rode into battle, William Lee, who was heavily armed, was protecting him. And so in, let's go forward. This is uh, the place where this scene that I just showed you took place about a mile uh, would have been west of uh, where the fighting took place at the Battle of Monmouth. Here's uh, Gary Wheeler Stone, the park historian at the time, and the American army was coming down from Tenon Church. Let's look at the next one here. And here's a close-up uh, here. Gary is uh, showing uh, an old uh, photograph of what the road looked like. And let's go on. Let's go on. We're not going on. Whoops. Okay. Uh, is this the next one? Yes. Okay. Whoops. I'm sorry. Okay. So here's a close up. 
You see, here's Washington and here's uh, William Lee. And uh, discussing this with the artist George Woodbridge, uh, I said, well, what would he have been carried? Well, he's carrying a carbine and two heavy horse pistols to defend Washington, to protect him. The aides are behind him. These guys couldn't protect him. Okay. And uh, William Lee appears, at least in this portrait of Washington by John Trumbull. There's William Lee in the background. Trumbull painted this in London from memory, and um, he didn't really know what, what Billy Lee actually looked like. And uh, I'm sorry the way this thing is moving. Let me go on to the next one. Okay, and here is Edward Savage, the famous uh, portrait of the Washington family. And I think the gentleman we're missing, Billy Lee, who's off on the side there, but he appears, uh, it's conjectural whether that's Billy Lee or another uh, black servant of George Washington. Of course, this was painted um, after the war, but uh, the figure on the extreme right is believed to be Billy Lee. And so going forward here again, here's the artist George Woodbridge uh, actually working on that illustration for my book. He was a great guy. And so I saved these. These were scraps. I said, uh, George, um, okay, I want to show Billy Lee what he looked like uh, riding next to Washington. This was uh, Woodbridge's first uh, little sketch. I said, no, this is crazy. I mean, this is not what the guy looked like. And then I know there's a second one here. Whoops. Here's the second one. I said, no, this is not right. He would have, he was an excellent horseman. He was able to ride. Washington was one of the greatest horsemen of the Revolutionary War period. William Lee was able to ride with him. I said, this is all wrong. This is not right. And so there's a third one. I want to, there it is. And so I said, yes, that's what I want. And that's what Woodbridge put into the, uh, into the illustration. Again, unfortunately, it doesn't appear in the second paperback edition. And I would urge you, if you like this book and find this all interesting, to buy one of the used copies. And there's a close-up of William Lee and the aides behind him. And so here, well, you know, you have depictions of Washington here at the Battle of Princeton. Uh, uh, this is a, a late portrait, certainly not accurate, but it gives you the idea of Washington riding in into the Battle of Princeton, uh, riding alone. Well, I believe that uh, William Lee was riding with him and protecting him uh, throughout the war. Um, of course, this is all conjectural, but very interesting as you study the aides de camp, uh, that these men were, were not soldiers. They, they, they could not protect Washington. Okay, so here's the Potts House at Valley Forge. Uh, this was Washington's headquarters. This is a small house. Uh, Washington had here probably six aides to camp working. He had his uh, commander in chief's guards surrounding the house and protecting it. He needed a place to store all his records. He needed a dining tent. He needed badge baggage tents. And so what was going on, there was a lot of carpenters. There were a lot of tradesmen in the, in the American army. And I'm trying to get to the next there. This is the back of the house. We know that added to this house were large wooden structures, actually temporary wooden structures added to the back of the house during the winter to house all the headquarters activities where the aides of the camp could sleep, where cooking was done, where Washington's papers were stored. So you see this little house. Well, this is not what it looked like at, at the year that the winter that Washington occupied, it was surrounded by any number of buildings and particularly huts, which were housing his personal bodyguards. The British knew he was here and, they, and the, the, um, the commander in chief's guard were protecting him from being kidnapped. Now here's the Wallace House in Somerville, New Jersey, Washington's headquarters in 78, 79. We know that there was large wooden structures that were attached to this building as well. And there's another interesting, right here, all on the right, we know that there were huts there housing the commander in chief's guard. And there was artillery placed uh, in this uh, back of the house as well and wooden structures added to the house during the winter. And here, um, the Ford Mansion in Morristown, New Jersey, 
Now, Washington's office would have occupied uh, the window on the left and the rear. Uh, they put a wooden structure onto this side of the mansion. Uh, on the right, the right window represents the office where the aides de camp were working. And um, if you wanted to see Washington, the front door was barred. You couldn't get in. It was That was absolutely locked. In the wooden structure would have been a number of guards and an officer sitting there, not one of the aides the camp. They were too busy working with Washington. So if you had some business with Washington or you had a dispatch for him, you'd walk into the, into the uh, wooden building and you would talk to the officer and he would make some decision whether uh, what to do with you. And then he would walk into the house and ask one of the aides de camp to come out and talk to you. They would never disturb Washington. I mean, you just couldn't walk in and talk to this guy. It was impossible. He was very heavily guarded and he was, he was kept away from any kind of routine work by the aides de camp. And I see we're almost running an hour. So let's quickly run through the balance of the program. Now, Here's a portrait of Richard Varick, a pre-war lawyer, a uh, good friend of, uh, of uh, the, the Schuyler, General Schuyler during the war. And um, Varick, uh, Washington invited Varick to become one of his aides during the course of the war, late in the war, because uh, Washington wanted all the drafts of his letters, some of which had been written very, very quickly. He wanted them transcribed very clearly and beautifully to be saved. And so you have in the Library of Congress, the Varick transcripts, which, which are copies of all of the, the drafts. Varick worked with a whole team of, of writers to copy all of Washington's uh, drafts of letters. Very interesting, this device that Varick is wearing was the badge of the Order of the Cincinnati. This was a fraternal or order organized at the end of the war, and their symbol was the badge, uh, the eagle, which they wore. So anytime you see that eagle in a portrait, this is a post-revolutionary war uniform because of the high color, but the badge, the Order of the Cincinnati Eagle, indicates that this portrait had to be done after the Revolutionary War. And let's look at a couple more. Here's James Peel, uh, Charles Wilson Peel's brother, who was a militia officer during, he was actually an, uh, uh, a captain in the Continental Army. There's the badge of the Order of the Cincinnati. Here is uh, Richard Varick, is a very old man, and there he proudly has his portrait painted of Varick Street. This guy made a fortune in establishing New York's first uh, suburban uh, community, which was Jersey City, New Jersey. And he was selling land, uh, you know, housing plots in Jersey City, which accounts for Varick Street in Jersey City. And he was also a mayor of the city of New York, which accounts for Varick Street in Manhattan. Here's Baron von Steuben, a uh, uh, foreign officer who had some European badges, but here very clearly you can see the badge of the Order of the Cincinnati that he's wearing. And um, we're gonna end here. I have to go on a little further. Uh, this is uh, a portrait painted by Joseph Wright in 1783, painted um, outside of Princeton where Washington was making his headquarters at Rocky Hill, New Jersey. Look at the very elaborate uh, epaulet that Washington is wearing. You could tell this is portrait is very late in the war, but Washington said that this was the best likeness of him ever painted. And you look at this figure, this is what the, the uh, athletic man of the 18th century looked like. These guys didn't lift weight or pump iron. They had very small shoulders. They had big bodies. They were horsemen. And this is the body of a, of a man who, uh, who got his exercise riding a horse. And here is where we'll end. This is uh, uh, Washington resigning his commission at Annapolis at the end of the war. Two of his last aides are, be, are with him, uh, David Humphreys and uh, uh, Benjamin Walker. Benjamin Walker was uh, another man on Washington's staff who was fluent in French who joined his staff late in the war. And here Washington, what's going on here is he is he's taken out the commission as commander in chief 
that the Continental Congress gave him at the beginning of the war, and he's handing it back to them. He controlled the army. The army controlled the country. The army was the power. Whoever controlled the army controlled the country. The, the Continental Congress, the civilian government was very weak and bankrupt. And three times during the course of the war, his officers said, you know, they invited him to overthrow the government uh, and uh, march on Philadelphia and declare a military dictatorship. And Washington squashed every one of those uh, embryonic efforts uh, to uh, to put the army in charge of the gov the country. And so here's the members of Congress all seated and Washington is standing and he's giving them back the piece of paper that appointed him commander in chief of the army. This was an unbelievable moment in American history. And uh, J um, uh, McHenry uh, was a member of uh, uh, Congress at this point. And McHenry wrote a letter to his fiance describing what happened. And I'll tell you, uh, I'll read you what McHenry wrote. Here's Washington resigning his, uh, his, the command of the Continental Army, giving them back the commission. The general's hand, which held his resignation, shook as he read it, and he was obliged to support the paper with both hands. He proceeded to say in the most penetrating manner, the great events on which my resignation depended having at length taken place. I have now the honor of offering my sincere congratulations to Congress and of presenting myself before them to surrender into their hands the trust committed to me and to claim indulgence of retiring from the service of my country. Then Washington said, now hint, now, Having now finished the work assigned me, I retire from the great theater of action and bidding an affectionate farewell to this august body under whose orders I have so long acted, I here offer my commission and take my leave of all the employments of public life. And then McHenry wrote to his fiance, McHenry said, so many circumstances crowded into view and gave rise to so many affecting emotions. The events of the revolution just accomplished, the new situation which had thrown the affairs of the world, the great man who had borne so conspicuous a figure in it, in the act, in the act of relinquishing all public employments and returning to private life. The past, the present, the future, the manner, the occasion, all conspire to render it a spectacle inexpressibly solemn and emotional. And um, I hope you enjoyed my presentation. And if you liked it, uh, I would encourage you to, uh, as they say, read the book. Um, Randy, thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you, thank you. Jeff? Art, thanks so much for this presentation. I really enjoyed it and um, I've already been working on the side and I've ordered my first edition book and I'm going to be sending it to you for your autograph. It would be my uh, pleasure. Uh, to our listeners and viewers, if you have questions that you would like to ask Art, please don't hesitate. Uh, send us either Randy or myself an email. You can get that off of our website at W A, excuse me, take that back, W Y A R R P um, dot org. And uh, we'll forward those on to Art and he'll get back to you. So this concludes our exclusive Williamsburg, Yorktown American Revolution Roundtable presentation by Art Lefwich. On, the, on behalf of Randy Flood and myself, I hope you enjoyed this as much as we did. And we look forward to you joining us again in the not too distant future. Uh, and hopefully sometime where we can all join fellowship and see each other in real time versus video. So until then, uh, I say a fun voyage. And my name is Jeff Lambert. So long for now.